Morning, Kitty. Morning, beautiful morning. Wonderful, Kitty Chiller. You've um, been with us since about, I think, when I started in 2008. Does that sound about oh, right? I think I predated you by a couple of decades. So my first, um, my first experience at the Barbs was, and I actually asked someone today, 1981. Well, there you go, that would have been so interesting. So, my mother and my, my late sister, uh, we organised aquathons. So, this was before the day of triathlon. Yeah. So, we organised aquathons, and it was on, they were on Wednesday nights, I think five or six o'clock. And we had, you know, anywhere between 50 and 100 people. And they were quite a, popular, I've even yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been told about them. Yeah, it's a 5,000 metre run and an 800 swim in the baths. And we just ran up and down, obviously, the bike path. I don't think the bike path existed then. Yeah. And swam in the baths. So, um, yes, it's 1981 that baths have been a part of my life. Wow, that's fantastic. And what's your attraction to the Brighton Baths? What, what, what draws you into it? Um, for me, it's a, it's a safe place to swim. I love swimming in the open water, but I'm not not so good outside of the nice, safe confines of the bath. So yeah. um, I love swimming. Just just that I'm a swimmer by, by profession, but I've swum since I was six years old in a chlorinated pool up and down, up and down. And for me, it's I love swimming, but it just that whole extra level of of freedom. Yeah. That 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 is just so invigorating and freeing for me. And now you're also. You touched on it, a very accomplished pen, pentathlete, and you represented Australia in the Sydney 2000 Olympics. What was that like? Um, came at the end of my career. Modern pentathlon is, is five sports, running, yeah. swimming, fencing, pistol shooting and horse riding. Yeah. Uh, it's always been an Olympic sport for men, uh, but for women, not for the first time until 2000. So I started the sport in 1981. Wow. Um, thinking that it would be in the Los Angeles Olympics in 1984 for women. Uh, so I had to wait 19 years wow. for my opportunity to go to the Olympic Games. So it was very much at the, uh, at the end of my career. I turned 36 the day of the competition in Sydney. Oh, wow. And most of my competitors were sort of 20 to 24. So obviously competing in Olympic Games at a hometown Olympic Games too, it was a, it was a great way to, to finish my career. And we're all the stories about the Olympic Village being quite vibrant <laughs> and, you know, was, were they true or...? Um, it was actually, it was a bit disappointing in a way, the pentathlon was on the very last day. Okay. So I went yeah. up to Sydney for the opening ceremony and for about one or two days. Then I came back to Melbourne, because the Games go for 16 days. Yeah. So I came back to Melbourne with my own home, my own coaches, my own food. And then literally just flew up to Sydney the day before the competition. So it sort of, I didn't really miss get that, that bit whole of Olympic experience. Oh, that um, could be a good thing. Well, I think it probably was a good thing. <laughs> if you're there to compete, which you are, uh, probably a good thing if you stay away. <laughs> now, you've continued your interest in the Olympics, and I think in 2016 you were part of, in, in my words, the, the uh, diplomatic team. Do you want to talk, and that was in Rio, do you want to talk me through that a little bit? Um, diplomatic team is a very non-French way of saying so my motto, <laughs> my title was chef de mission or chef de mission yeah. um, which basically means head of delegation so I was um, fortunate enough and had the great honour but also great responsibility of leading the whole Australian team so yeah. it was a team of around around 900 in total yeah. 124 athletes and, um, and associated officials you know, medical staff media staff administration staff um, it was a it was a huge role. <laughs> I think Rio was a was a very challenging games and widely acknowledged as the most the most difficult and challenging that there has been. Um, perhaps now, with the exception of Tokyo 2020, not yeah. so much. Um, yeah, it was a, it was a it was a very uh, it, as I said, it was a great honour, but it was a it was a really big challenge. Yeah, wonderful. And what's your role now? You've always taken on big roles. What's your current role? Uh, so I moved back to Melbourne two years ago. I lived away from Melbourne for 10 years. Yeah. Um, so it was lovely to come back to Melbourne and I came back to my current role, which is CEO of Gymnastics Australia. Uh, so I head up the National Sporting Organisation of, of Gymnastics. Uh, we've got 610 clubs right around the country, wow. obviously eight state and territory associations that we work closely with, uh, and over a quarter of a million members. It's amazing now. Obviously, the current COVID situation is affecting that. What effect has that 
had directly on, on you and your clubs? Well, I suppose pretty much the same as here, but multiplied by 600 times. Yeah. Um, midday on the 23rd of March was, was D-Day for us all in, mm. in that land when every single one of our 600 clubs closed their doors. Mm. Um, you know, a lot of those clubs are, are not for profits. They're, they're mm. put away, pack away, you know, put out, pack away in, in church halls, you know, renting. Mm. It's going to be hard for a lot of them to survive. Mm. Um, those other smaller clubs who need to who need to pay rent during this period, but obviously there's no classes, there's no tuition, there's no coaching, so they're not getting any membership fees. Um, that comes up the tree. So Gymnastics Australia, we we won't get any membership fees for the entire year, which is you know a, a very significant part of our revenue. Um, but the most important thing for us are, are the clubs and, and making sure that to the best that we can, we support those clubs and give them the resources and the support and the advice so that when one day soon, hopefully, we're all told we can open our doors, um, we've sort of got a saying that when we're good to go, we'll be ready to go. Yeah, that's that's really good actually, and that's what we're trying to do at the same time. Yeah. Now, the, those sporting clubs are quite important to Australia and Australians. Um, are you getting any support or are you spending your time trying to get some support in that area? Or? Certainly spending a lot of time trying to get support. Um, yeah. There's some really good state sport specific stimulus packages around in some states and territories, so our state associations are applying for those. Um, the job people obviously helped helped a lot. Mm. Um, although unfortunately a lot of for a lot of the, the casuals and a lot of the, the gym clubs it, it it's it's challenging to apply a job keeper for a lot of those, mm. um, a lot of those workers. Um, from a financial point of view, we have regular meetings with uh, with Sport Australia, obviously the AIS, the Australian Olympic Committee is also really helping Olympic sports just yeah. to try and get a collective voice to go to federal government and uh, and and free up some money, hopefully that's already in the system, yeah. to enable us all to, to keep our doors open. Mm. Good luck with that. Um, and I think we're all behind you with being successful in that because it's, it can be easily overlooked but long term undervalued. So good luck with that. Thank you. I, I think just, just on that, that you know, clubs like this, like the Brighton Barbs and, and all my clubs, or all our gymnastics clubs, when we get out of this, sport, recreation, activity is going to be such a huge part of getting back to normal life. Mm. Um, for kids, for adults, for everybody, for the full breath, getting for, for mental health as well as physical. You know, yeah, we can all go out and walk now and on days like this, but in that interactive environment, the social environment, doing classes, it, it's a huge relief, it's a huge outlet for so many people. And I think sport will be expected to be a big part of our recovery from this I agree. community level. And, and that's why we all need to do all we can to stay engaged with our members, as yeah. you're doing. Yeah. Um, during this time. What about taking the pressure off yourself? This is obviously putting a bit of pressure on you. Um, what are you doing for your own de to decompress yourself? Um, I'm walking a lot. Um, yeah. That's about all. I'm sort of lucky to, to live you know, in 50 metres of the water, so I walk a lot, either toward Elwood or, or toward Denny Beach um, mm. every day, trying to get my up to 12,000 steps a day. That's good. But hitting 15,000 most days. Um, oh, that's wonderful. But uh, yeah, working a lot, literally working, working, you know, twenty four seven on calls and mm. discovering every possible technology between Zoom and Teams and yeah. all those other <laughs> ways of staying in touch, which is really important. But yeah, I really recognise the um, the importance of staying physically active, mm. and I'm doing some meditation as well by the by the water every morning just to start the day to to try and be in a space to. Um, yeah, to help get us through this. Yeah, good. Thanks, Kitty. Thanks for coming Thank down you. and no, spending such a beautiful Sunday morning. Yeah, it is. Thank you. Thanks, Kitty.